Good morning, Virginia. This is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial. Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.15. This is Story Time, brought to you by Safe Haven Ministries. I am your host, Brother D. As always, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our many blessings. It started with when we woke up this morning and opened our eyes, and it's continued on. Father, we ask you be with those that are traveling today. Please keep them safe. Father, open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes as we bring forth today's stories. Please let us all remember that Jesus is our salvation, and we need to be more like him. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Die, Brother D. What are we going to do today? Uh, what are we going to do today? Calm down, dog. I already told you what we were going to do. Da, yeah, but we get down here on the radio and I get all, you get all excited and your tail starts wagging and it shakes your brain till you just can't think anymore. Da, wait a minute. Well, that's how you're acting, isn't it? Da, okay. I, I, I guess there is a little truth to that. Well, I'm going to tell you about a very funny animal. The funny ha-ha or funny strange or, or what kind of animal is it? Well, it's known as a rock hydrax. Now, you ever hear of that? Duh, no. You need to read your Bible and study a little more. You hear of a rock badger? Duh, no. Well, then you may know it as a coney. Duh, okay, I've heard of a coney. That's right. It's an odd little animal with a thick set body, small rounded ears, short legs, and an almost invisible tail. Now it has a sharp snout, and on each foot there's a soft moist pad that it enables it to cling vertically to rocks and trees. Now it only measures about 16 inches long, and it weighs maybe 8 pounds at its largest, and it resembles basically a fat, tailless rat. Duh, okay. So it, it's a rodent. Well, actually, the coney is a relative of the elephant. Duh, wait a minute. Well, I'm just, I'm just telling you what is known as facts. Rock hydrexes live in colonies ranging in size from 12 to 50 individuals. They are active during the cool hours of the morning, late afternoon, and then through the night. Now, they have sentinels watching the skies and the hillsides and everything for their enemies. Rock hydraxes enjoy laying together and basically observing other animals and human beings from a safe distance. For example, they will stand up and crane their necks to get a better view of a man on a donkey rounding a curve. Now, any sudden movement alarms the sentinels who alert the rest of the group. In less time than it says to take over, for you to say rock Hydrex, all those conies have disappeared and will remain hidden for at least a half an hour. Duh. So they, 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 they really know where, how to hide. Well, you see, their enemies include snakes and big cats, especially birds of prey, and sometimes man. And even though it is a small animal, the rock hydrax will not hesitate to attack a tormentor of any size when it's cornered. And you see, it has sharp incisors that are quite capable of inflicting some serious harm. Duh. So it may be small, but he can be mean when he needs to. That's right, dog. You see, the animal has one particular trick that saves it from becoming the dinner of an enemy that tries to follow the coney into its rocky hiding places. You see, when it's trapped under the rock, the animal finds the narrowest place it can and crawls into it and then it inflates its lungs to puff up its body. Duh, okay, so basically it jams itself so tightly in the passage that, 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 that it's very seldom possible to get it, get a hold of it and pull it out. That's right, though. And you see, now in the Bible, rocks are sometimes used as symbols of both safety and hiding places, just like the rock conies use them for. And the psalmist wrote, of God as the rock of my refuge. Duh, that's Psalms 94, 
verse 22. That's right, though. You see, as a rock badger, which our text says are a feeble folk, find protection in the rock. So we, weak though we are, can find refuge in the rock of Jesus Christ. The, and the verse comes from Proverbs. It's chapter 30, verse 26. The rock badgers are a feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crags. That's right, though. They trust in their rocks, just like we should trust in our rock, Jesus Christ. Duh, okay. Well, I got one for you, Brother D. You ever hear of an ancient prescription? You talking about medicine, drugs? Duh, yeah. Yeah, you know, medicines have been around for a long, long time. Well, you're right, though. So go on, tell me about this. The, the oldest known medical prescriptions that we have were written on clay tablets 4,000 years ago. Okay, I remember that. There was 15 of these prescriptions that were written down by a Sumerian physician who was who basically advised using various salves. That's salves, Brother D. And, and he, he, he advised using the salves and washes and poultices prepared by mixing ground seeds, bark, fruit, and leaves of plants with water, milk, or wine. And, and he even wrote one that for special effects add powdered turtle shells. And, and bat droppings and, and snake skins that he recommended for one of them. Well, okay, dog, but, you know, <laughs> it's, you stop and think. If these treatments seem strange, consider some of the thought to be superstitious potions and medicines used by primitive medicine men that, that today are prescribed in other forms by doctors from our best medical schools. You know, for a careful study has been made and has revealed that while much of the early medicine is just superstition, some folk medicines hold a key to the relief and cure of many diseases. Duh. I, I know that there's a certain willow tree that it, it can, the bark of it can be used like a painkiller. That's right, dog. It's similar to having an aspirin and everything. But you see, the use of the modern use of tranquilizing drugs as mental depressants and mood altering medicines was basically anticipated in 1925. It was started when a famous Nigerian became severely mentally ill in England. Now, they sent back for a witch doctor from his home in Nigeria to treat the man, and this witch doctor had this special medicine. Now, that medicine was the root of a plant called the Rawufa. Now, this native medicine man had used this to treat what was called moon madness for, you know, he knew, he knew about it, and it had been passed on for about 2,500 years. The success of the witch doctor launched a series of medical investigations that basically started what is now known as a multi-million dollar industry, you know. Now, we don't endorse the work of a witch doctor, but... Even such men sometimes possess bits of valid knowledge. You know, and medicine is often a life-saving blessing. Modern medical professionals are ever on the lookout for better and more effective medicines. But it is widely accepted that a happy, contented person is less susceptible to disease than an unhappy one. Duh, yep. If you're smiling on the inside, it's hard for the nasties to get there and make you ill. You're right, dog, but here's the thing. You know, we got to stop and think. Since guilt, anger, and envy can take away our happiness, we must find a way to restore it. And with the love of Jesus in our life, peace can reign, and we can be filled with happiness once again. Duh. And Proverbs, once again, is where we get the next verse. It comes from chapter 17, verse 22. It's, it says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. That's right, though. We need to learn, as the old song says, don't worry, be happy. Duh. Yeah, but our happiness needs to be found in a special way. Well, though, that special way is Jesus Christ. I've heard several say that you can 
meditate and find inner peace and all this other stuff. I found through the years I tried that, but through the years the only true inner peace I've ever gotten has come through Jesus Christ. The, I got a question, Brother D. Have you ever heard of a burying? You mean a burying beetle? The, yeah, you read that story too, didn't you? Well, <clears throat> you see, Mr. Tucker, the gentleman that we get some of these stories from, he basically had mice when he was a kid. Now, you know, one of them got old and died and everything. And he was going to bury the little mouse and everything. So he would laid it outside and everything in the yard with the intention of going back to bury it. But he forgot about it for a time. And basically, in fact, it was the next day when he remembered the mouse. And he hurried out to where it lay so that he could bury it before something else got a hold of it. Duh, you mean he hurried out to where it used to be. That's right, though. He said that when he got to looking, he had to kind of search around. But he found it nearby, and he was amazed because it was moving, and it was half buried in sand. Duh, a dead mouse was moving and half buried in sand. That's right. So naturally, he was very curious. <laughs> but he wasn't so curious that he reached down and grabbed the mouse itself. He took a stick and he rolled the body over. Now, that's when he saw what, what turned out to be a pair of red and black sexton beetles busily working to bury that mouse. Duh, okay. Uh, that, that's strange. No, that is a characteristic of the nature that the, these beetles, you know, the carcasses of these of the dead animals are quickly disposed of, and everything, you know, it, one of the things you got the carrion eating birds and other animals, or but you also got scavenging insects like the sexton beetles. Now the sexton beetle is only about an inch long, but it is quite capable of burying an animal as large as a mole. Uh, so in other words, that mouse wasn't really a problem, was it? Well, you stop and think about this. When the male sexton beetle discovers a dead animal, he sets to work immediately. If the soil isn't soft enough for burying where the body is laying, the beetle will move it to more workable soil. Now, here's the thing. Sexton beetles have been known to move animals across distances of up to 10 feet. Duh, okay. And here's the thing, this is accomplished by the beetle laying on its back, wiggling under the animal and then pushing upwards with all of its legs. The female may arrive at any time to join the male under the body. Now the burial is accomplished by digging out the soil underneath the body. Thus, it lets the body be lowered down. Now, the thing is, you know, they're letting this like the mouse, being settled slowly into the ground. Now, as they keep digging down, eventually the loose soil caves in on top of the whole operation, and then the burial is complete. Now, the burying team then excavates a chamber off to the side where the female will lay her eggs, and there they will raise their young as a snug family with enough food to last the winter. Duh, I never thought about that, Brother D. Well, that's just it. Thinking of the beetles at work, you're reminded of Jesus talking about the dead burying the dead. The barriers he had in mind were, of course, the spiritually unfeeling, you know, or the spiritually dead. You know, they could afford to take all the time an Eastern funeral required. Duh, oh, that's right. They had, they had a lot of ritual in it, didn't they? Paid mourners and everything else. That's right. But, you know, we need to remember... You know, Jesus was talking to those who choose to be spiritually alive. They should be more concerned with spreading heavenly tidings, which required haste. And that's the thing. We need to remember, you know, yes, we bury our dead, we mourn. It, it's a sad thing. But we also got to remember, we need to be spreading the good news. Duh. We, we've had friends who have passed away and... and, and 
they 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 had their lives basically they they lived their lives for Jesus. That's right, dog. You're getting tongue tied. Uh, I know, but I start thinking about them. I get a little sad, but then I remember that that they were more worried about everybody else getting to know Jesus than they were about themselves because they already knew Jesus. That's right, dog. And our verse for this one is Luke 9.60. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Duh. So we, we, need to be, we need to be getting out there and doing the Great Commission, don't we, Brother D? That's right, though. That's one of the many things. But I'm going to ask you this. You've heard of color blindness? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, our friend Rodney is uh, colorblind. Well, here's something you probably didn't know. It doesn't always mean that a person can't see any color at all. Duh, okay. Then explain yourself. If they're colorblind, how can they see some color? Well, you see, most people who are colorblind can see certain colors, except maybe red and green. And that becomes a problem for colorblind drivers because they can't tell the difference between a red and a green traffic signal. And to such a person, both of these colors look grayish. So they have to learn the positions of the lights to respond to them. But a much rarer form of color blindness is a type where a person can't see yellow or blue. And now very rarely there is someone who actually is totally colorblind, unable to see any color at all. Duh. Oh, man. Yeah. If you couldn't see yellow, imagine being a bee and you couldn't see yellow. Well, you wouldn't be a bee very long. You'd be a dead bee, dog. That's the thing. That's all bee, you know, bees see yellow, and they know that means that's where the nectar is. Now, for some reason, men are more colorblind, or often more colorblind, than women. So you stop and think about that. About one out of every 12 males is at least partially colorblind. But not more than one in 200 females have this problem. Duh, okay. So, you mean we will probably never know a colorblind, a totally colorblind person because these individuals with such a case are so rare, right? That's right, though. But, you know, and such a person sees everything in different shades of gray, which is... You stop and think. That's somewhat like looking out over the countryside on a moonlit night. Because basically in that dim light on the moonlit night, the color receptors in our eyes are not very active. And we cannot see color at night unless there's enough light. And unfortunately, that's how these people see even in the daytime. But a colorblind person that has this problem all the time, no matter how much the light is present, uh, I know it was once believed that animals are colorblind, Brother D. That's right, but you know, that's the thing. Now scientists have learned that except for nocturnal animals that live in the absence of light, most creatures do see some kind of color. And in fact, as is in the case of the nectar-seeing bees, as we were talking about, they look for that yellow flower center. And the lives of some depend upon their color perception. But you see, the colorblind person who gets into heaven, you know, it would be something like, like the blind person. They will receive that extra bonus. Because imagine what a sight it would be for them when, for the first time, they see all of God's colors in perfect harmony and brilliance, as none of us can now see them. Because we take it for granted. Duh, I never thought about that. But, you know... 1 Corinthians 2 9 says this, Brother D. It says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of men things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's right, dog. When we all finally get to heaven, it's going to be an amazing sight. Think about it. Duh. Yeah, but hey, the, you know, that's the one thing. Are we going to wake up before we get there? Well, you stop and think about this. Have you ever wondered what wakes you up in the morning? Duh. 
Yeah, my alarm clock. <laughs> yeah, I've seen you sleep through that thing several times. That snooze bar just about wore out on it, didn't it? Uh, well, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> well, even when your clock doesn't go off, you still wake up, and he's usually right on time. Duh. Well, that's you, because you get up at the same time every morning and everything. You always wake up at, at the same time. It, it comes because you have to get up to go work and drive the bus. That's right, dog. And for the last two days, I haven't had to drive the bus, but I'm still waking up 5 o'clock in the morning. But, you know, that's the thing. Now, Mr. Tucker, when he was in college, he began to wonder how the birds knew when to wake up. You see, you stop and think about this. Many birds start singing before daylight. And in the springtime, you know, they really sing at this time of the day because, you know, as it's been known, it's called the dawn chorus because all together the many singing birds make a beautiful melody in the early morning darkness. Uh, yeah, I, I know what you mean. And, and they continue to sing until after daylight and, and everything when they start looking for food. That's right, Doug. And Mr. Tucker said he wondered how these birds knew when to wake up and begin singing. Well, uh, I've often wondered that, too. Well, that's just it. Mr. Tucker read all he could find on that subject, but no one seemed to know. Some authorities thought that it was the breaking of dawn that awakened the birds. So Mr. Tucker and some of his friends, they set up an experiment with a very sensitive light meter to find out whether... The birds actually awakened when there was a small amount of light. Now, here's the thing. They found out that the birds started singing before there was ever any measurable lights at all. It was something else that was waking them up. Duh, okay. So, he learned that in college. That's right. But, here's the thing. It wasn't long ago he learned that, that, that what probably was the answer. It seems scientists have learned that animals and men have a built-in daily rhythm. And there's some kind of clock inside of us that determines many of the things that we do, such as waking up in the morning. Now, they did some experiments with some blind sparrows and found that even when the birds had no way of knowing when it was light, they still lived according to the 24-hour daily cycle of their species. They started singing before it ever the sun ever started to rise. Duh. Oh, man. That's right. You see, and here's the thing. Our text is a prophecy that Jesus would commune with his Father each morning. In the same way, our Heavenly Father will commune with us in blessing and fellowship if we will just give ourselves to him as Jesus did. And Isaiah 50, verse 4 says this. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. So you stop and think about it. We're sitting there. We got an eternal clock going off. You know, some call it the circadia rhythm and everything. But, you know, you stop and think how God has built all this intricacy into our bodies. You know, amazing. Evolution can't do that. There's no way the evolutionists can ever prove that all this stuff is just by happen chance. It shows divine creation. It shows God. And the only way to God is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Duh, Brother D, you need to look at that time. That's right, dog. Let us end with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our many blessings. Father, we are grateful for all that you've given us. Father, we're grateful that we got through this school year and no children were injured. We had one bus accident, but no one was hurt. And Father, we're grateful for the protection that you've provided for our students this year. It's been trying times with COVID, Father, but you've been there, you've strengthened us, you've helped us all get through. Father, we ask you please be with the armed forces, the ones that protect us, so that we may worship you as we see fit. Be with our first responders, the doctors, nurses, firefighters, EMTs, our law enforcement officers that keep us safe 
and protect us 24-7. Father, we ask a special blessing. We have friends that are serving with the UN, both in the Ukraine and in Syria. Father, we ask that you reach out and touch them. They're working as doctors and nurses, and they see such horrific things day in and day out. Please bless them. Touch them in a special way. Let them know that they are loved. Father, once again, we are grateful for just being alive. We look forward to the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Duh, folks, if you like what you hear on the radio, you can contact us at, at 434-390-5981. That, that's 434-390-5981. That's right, folks, or you can email us at emtx3xl at gmail.com. Again, that is emtx3xl at gmail.com. Once again, folks, we remind everybody, WGFW is a Christian radio station, and it needs your support. Send your donations to WGFW, or send it to God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Duh, you, you were going to give the station call letters, and they don't need to put that on the chat. That's right, dog. They need to put God's Final Call and Warning and send it to P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Now you can put GFCW on the check if you need to, folks. Once again, story time, I'd like to thank Safe Haven Ministries for sponsoring us. Safe Haven Ministries also sponsors Safe Haven Student Center, located in the shops at College Park in Farmville, Virginia. Guys, if you're still doing virtual studies or you've got summer school where you're going to need the Wi Fi, we got free Wi Fi, free snacks, free drinks. We got game tables, we got board games, we got everything you need to kick back, relax, get your studies done. No drinking, no drugs, no smoking, no vaping, no pressure. Once again, folks, this is WGFW, Drake's Branch, Virginia, 88.7 on your FM dial. The time is 9.43. We return you to the regular broadcast. Duh, folks, may your week be blessed. Don't forget to join us next Sunday morning at 9.15 for another episode of Storytime.